Oh, I love when the buttons work, Aiden. Isn't it fantastic? It's so fantastic. All right, everybody, welcome back to what is one of the one of the most exciting episodes of the show I think we've ever had. Oh, by far. Uh, clearly, the topic is something you guys like. <laughs> this uh, the the video we put out Friday is our fastest video to ever hit 100,000 views, so that's pretty cool. Um, but what this is not about that. This is about uh, our guest today, who is Ashton Forbes. And Ashton has been uh, kind of a rising star on Twitter lately, especially for uh, for some of this some of this UFO stuff. I think there's there's been a lot of videos, a lot of stories, a lot of narratives floating around for the last nine years, and you seem to be putting them together in a way nobody nobody really has yet. Uh, so the the big ones that caught my attention, I was I was not really following it very closely until I saw the one where you put up the videos. Uh, of, yeah. of what appears to be MH370 uh, heading into what what looks like a wormhole, some sort of portal in the sky. And the very first thing I said was I quote retweeted it and I was like, I know four things about this case and I, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. Should I not be intrigued? And everyone was like, you should absolutely be intrigued. So I started, I, I started following you. I was looking at a lot of your stuff and I, you know, I, I think the best way we can do this is to sort of launch into, you know, Ashton, who, who are you? And How'd you get here? Like, what's your background? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So my name is Ashton Forbes. I like to think I'm just a normal person that's been put into an uh, extraordinary situation. Um, I never thought that I'd be in the kind of position that I'm in right now, where we are potentially disclosing, I think, the most important videos in the history of the world. My background is pretty mundane. I've mm -hmm. been a IT consultant for really my whole career, 18 years, about. Um, I have been interested in UFOlogy since about 2017 when the DOD Navy videos right. were declassified. That's when I kind of had my epiphany moment of, oh, aha, there might actually be something here that I should look into. Since then, I've mainly been a lurker, I suppose you could say, in the social media scene. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, watching and seeing, I've seen all kinds of different videos that have been posted out there. Um, and, you know, when it came to these videos, I had never seen anything of this level of quality. And my mm -hmm. immediate thoughts were of those 2017 videos, mm -hmm. which interestingly enough, those videos had been uh, debunked for nine years before apparently they were declassified and proven to be real. Right. Um, so I got involved in the UFO community because when I saw the MH370 videos, I thought for sure we were looking at non-human intelligence initially. Mm -hmm. um, it just looked so advanced and still does, honestly, to this point. Uh, and as I've talked with physicists, engineers, people in the community, dug into the case, uh, we've I've personally had a kind of a change of what my thought process is related to mm -hmm. it. And I've tried to approach this from a very scientific perspective. I consider myself to be a very logical, rational person mm -hmm. where I didn't want to come to any conclusions ahead of time. And maybe I was hasty early on when I did do that. Mm -hmm. um, I started this organization, MH370X which I just put an X at the end of MH370, just sounded right. good. <laughs> That's and what it's, you uh, do. That's what you do yeah. in sci-fi and, you know, all the, yeah, yeah, all exactly. the, all I mean, the crazy that. nonsense that goes on. Plus it worked with the whole X Twitter situation yeah, too. Definitely. So chose Twitter as the platform to really uh, espouse all these, uh, this, this situation to expl uh, kind of get to the bottom of this conspiracy, mostly because I figured it was the least censored platform of all of social media, which yeah, some people may laugh at, but uh, social media is in a bad shape these days yeah. relative to government control. And uh, we've got about 150 people, I think, on in our organization now at MH370X. Mm -hmm. A lot of really dedicated volunteers who put in tons of time pulling up old articles, etc. This really began as a community-led investigation on mm -hmm. social media where mainly Reddit, but also Twitter and even 4chan actually. <laughs> We're really going out there to get the word out to spread that these videos, you know, had some level of authenticity that I deserve to be dug into. Right. And it morphed into something now, which is, I don't know, it's it's hard for me to even take in how big it's starting to get. You know, I've met people like Jamie Mousen, who's mm -hmm. the one who's in, you know, Mexico, who has been promoting the Nazca mummies. Mm -hmm. I was able to talk to him in person. Um, I've got connections with, again, physicists. I was able to interview Salvatore Pius. I've started my own podcast because of interviewing Salvatore Pius. What's, uh, what's the podcast called? Uh, it's called Hard Truths. I came up with a, a new name for it, just like <laughs> right on the spot. And the reason for that is it's uh, I want it to be a podcast that's about advanced technology and what it means for us as a civilization. So I want to be able to interview people that are on that cutting edge of what you know. what is the stuff that people have a hard time believing to be mm -hmm. real. 
the same way that people, I think, have a really hard time believing that the MH370 videos are real. Um, and I think that that is a combination of factors. The biggest factor is that a lot of people simply believe what they're told to believe. Right. Now, that either that's from the television, from the authorities, or from social media personalities that they trust. And I think that what we need to get back to is critical thinking. Mm -hmm. How do you learn how to critical think? Don't just believe whatever the headline tells you. Don't believe what the description of a YouTube video tells you. Really look into the evidence and weigh it out. And that's why from this investigation standpoint, you'll see pinned to my profile, all evidence to date. It's mm -hmm. listed out systematically. You can go through, I've been as transparent as possible with the investigation. You mm -hmm. can go through my Twitter highlights and you can actually see the evolution of the case in reverse chronological order right. going all the way back to early August. Um, and so that's kind of what I want to show people too, is that, you know, I'm an honest person that's just putting the information out there as best I can, because you have to expect that you're going to be attacked, right? Especially with something this large. Mm -hmm. And so it's extremely important to be transparent. Yeah. And that's why I even stream my own, my own like investigations now, like pretty much every day mm -hmm. we started a YouTube just like two weeks ago or less. It's already got over 6,000 followers, subscribers on it. And people kind of just hang out at night, uh, and just kind of, uh, work and, you know, do MH370, uh, X stuff and put it out there. So I right. guess that's me. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I like, I like the approach. <laughs> it's the yeah. exact same thing we've taken, um, which we've also, We've seen the same kind of pushback from some people who, you know, it's, they, they really dug in their heels on a certain explanation for something. And the moment that it, it starts to seem like maybe, maybe it's not what they thought. A lot of people do not want to accept that new information might be out there. And it's not just, it's not just in the, like the UFO, the Bigfoot, the missing 411. It's also just in, like archaeology and history yeah. and anything that is kind of, you have clues to what happened, but you don't know for sure people come up yep. with those theories and they really, really stick to them and they don't want to believe it might be false. Uh, so I think that's where a lot of the animosity definitely comes from. I do, before we start, you know, before we quickly go into sort of the, the story of MH370, I would want to ask, you know, what, what does MH, what does MH370X do as an organization? What's the, the mission statement, I guess, like, what are you guys yeah. doing? Um, the, the mission statement is really, uh, uh, true disclosure on our terms mm -hmm. and not letting anybody else set the narrative or timelines. So we're going to get the truth. We're going to expose the truth and mm -hmm. we're not going to wait for the government or media to tell us what that truth is. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that these videos we've proven they date back to 2014. I actually saw one of them in 2014, well before I ever could have believed the mm -hmm. videos to be real. And I, I think many thousands of people will also testify to that fact. These may be the last time that we have the opportunity for true disclosure on our own terms, not from the government, from the public, because from now, this point forward, really everything will be seen as being AI generated, deep fake, right? Like I mm -hmm. could never imagine that AI would be advanced as it is now. Yeah, um, it's scary. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. <laughs> yep. As a content creator, I kind of hate it, actually, because there's yeah. a lot of just BS populating everybody's feed now. Well, and also the active scams that people are running with it are pretty it's, scary it's, and dangerous. It's all disgusting what people are doing. But, you know, I, I think I, I think that's the, the beauty of these platforms, though, is that, you know, to the extent that you can avoid the, the algorithmic censorship, there's definitely an ability for people to get out there and without needing a a platform like Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, say what they think is going on and reach an audience. Now, of course, that's a double-edged sword because there's plenty of con artists out there doing the exact same thing, but the facts do always speak for themselves. And that's that was the sense I got from you from our first communication was that you really do just care about finding out what the truth is. And I think if you, uh, you strike me as the kind of guy who if you were presented evidence that something that you were talking about was completely wrong, you would accept it and reframe and try and figure out okay well how does it work in the absence of that is that the right read yeah i mean that's actually what's happened several times too you mm -hmm. know when i first started I, I thought that i trusted all the official data i thought this plane crashed in the south indian ocean i thought when we were looking at these videos we must be looking at sunlight reflecting off of it in the early morning because mm -hmm. that's what they claim where the plane crashed i was actually convinced there must be a minus sign in front of the coordinates even though now it seems silly because i if you put a minus sign in front of the coordinates in the satellite video it puts it right in the South Indian Ocean along the route of this whisper route. Mm -hmm. And so I just believed all this official information to be true. Right. And then as we've kind of dug into it and realized that like, I always had this inkling and it didn't really make a lot of sense. We looked into the additional evidence. Uh, we were able to prove just conclusively 
that it can't be the South Indian Ocean. Um, because if you looked at the coordinate shifts in the sat in the satellite video, um, it goes to the east. You can see the mm -hmm. coordinate shift to the east. That means it doesn't matter what we're seeing visually. Like even if this is mirrored, mm -hmm. this has to be going to the east. Right. And if it was in the South Indian Ocean, there's a minus sign. That meant the plane would be going north into the east. Mm -hmm. But the problem is if you go north into the east, you're turning right. Yeah. And in our videos, the plane's turning left mm -hmm. in both videos. So this meant that the coordinates actually had to be in the Nicobar Island. So this was me just following the evidence and then realizing, wow, so we're not looking at sunlight on here, right? And we mm -hmm. even have people, like even the corridor crew, I watched a video that's not even released yet. Like, it doesn't matter how many subs you have. Mm -hmm. if you, even if you're a 10 million subscriber channel, you can still make objectively wrong statements. Oh, yeah. And they, they did, and they claim that we're looking at sunlight and that there's some directional light, stuff like mm -hmm. that. They're just objectively false statements. So even I can get stuff wrong, and then really what it is and what this investigation has been about is following the evidence to wherever that leads. And that led us to the lithium ion battery fire where we then mm -hmm. realized like, okay, there's this, all these witnesses are all corroborating the exact same event. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, again, I think that the reason why like the followers have grown so much is that these are people that they're, I'm not asking anyone to believe what I'm saying. I'm saying, look at this evidence. It's mm -hmm. so damning, right. so conclusive that you're going to, everyone's going to realize that at minimum, the official's mm -hmm. narrative doesn't make any sense. Right. And then from there, people can kind of believe whatever they want to believe about the videos. Right. Yeah. So I definitely can't argue with you. <laughs> I, I can't argue with you about any of that. Um, I definitely, the, the Nicobar Island stuff and the, the eyewitness accounts definitely strike me as interesting. I want to, for anybody who might not know the story, really quickly go through everything that happened at, uh, basically according to all reports that i could find flight checks uh pilot mental health crew safety the number of people on the plane the amount of cargo on the plane everything was well within regulation takes off at 12 41 a.m uh it makes it to the transfer point from kuala lumpur to ho chi minh at around 1 19 a.m and then there's the the famous you know good night uh malaysia 370 and then nobody hears from the plane ever again. I think it takes uh, about 20 minutes for Ho Chi Minh. It was 1.39 a.m. when Ho Chi Minh contacts Kuala Lumpur and says, hey, uh, status update on MH370. And they're basically like, we handed them off to you. Have you not heard from them? So that 20 minute period seems to be where, that that's where it drops off radar. That's where everybody loses it. The Whatever uh, transponders, I don't totally understand how all of this works. I understand it was their their ADS-B system went down, um, either was deliberately turned off or was somehow jammed. Uh, and then a pilot claims that at 1.30 they were able to make contact. Uh, and then the Malaysian Airlines company actually says at 2.02 a.m. it was over eastern Vietnam. At 2.08 a.m. it was in Cambodian airspace. Rolls-Royce was allegedly the source for this and then said, no, we're not. Uh, and then Inmarsat comes into the picture and everybody's like, oh, well, actually we have data. And we show that this plane headed south along this trajectory, and we think we last had contact with it somewhere along this arc. Meanwhile, the Malaysian Air Force says, we caught it on primary radar doing a U-turn, coming down towards Penang, and then shooting northwest up towards the Nicobar Islands. It gets uh, it gets off off radar at point, waypoint Nikar about, and then after that, that's when it allegedly then turned left again and headed south. My read looking through everything was my, my opinion has been since, since going to research it, I think the plane was shot down over the South China sea. So that's, that's where I've been looking at it. And obviously that doesn't gel with the theory of, Oh, it flew towards the Nicobar islands. But my, my feeling is basically based in distrust of government. <laughs> um, Cause the way I see it, I'm like, ah, well, if the plane did get, if it did go down over the South China sea, I would completely expect the Malaysian government to lie about it while they figured out what was going on, because that's what our government would do. Well, and then also the fact that our government by your read, yeah, may very well have had a hand in helping them lie. About yeah. It. Those data points are really weird. Uh, the, how they recovered, recovered the hard drive and we're like, oh, well there's data points that show it did this. Uh, I don't believe the FBI as far as I can throw their headquarters. Yeah, well, and the, the flight sim thing from the FBI yeah, as well. Exactly, that's what, that's what I was talking yeah. about. Yeah. So the recovered data points from the flight simulator yeah. that suggested that it actually did fly, that he had, that he had uh, programmed flight simulator paths to fly along this route. I, of course, cannot, uh, cannot prove any of that. And it seems like, 
at face value, the way I'm looking at it right now, it looks like you do have better evidence on your side than I do. Uh, the, the main, the question I would want to ask is mm -hmm. looking at it, seeing these videos, uh, seeing the satellite data, everything, what are your thoughts on some of the other sort of, why would you disagree with the Cindy Hendry version where she thinks she found the debris in the, uh, South China Sea or, uh, what was it? Jim Wise? Jeff Wise? Uh, Jeff Wise. Uh, Jeff Wise, yeah, his yeah. opinion, I, I think this was, I think I it was it ridiculous to, to say it was Iran or Russia because why that felt like he was just trying to say something about russia for clicks um but it really made no sense that russia would kidnap a malaysian airlines flight uh four months before they shot a different one down yeah um but yeah so uh, what what are your thoughts on i guess those other narratives and why was it was it purely this this video evidence and these eyewitness statements that led you away from looking at maybe a South China Sea narrative, or was there sort of a, a reason you disagree with those aside from the evidence you've compiled? Well, I tried to get through the Netflix documentary before I even watched these videos or anything like this happened. I couldn't mm -hmm. even make it through it because I thought it was so terrible. Just nothing made any sense that anyone was presenting. Uh, I've talked to Cindy in mm -hmm. a space, actually. I found her to be one of the least credible people possible. I went and looked at her evidence and none of it actually makes sense. It doesn't even, the size and, and scale doesn't even add up. Mm -hmm. there's no way we're looking at pieces of the plane in those satellite pictures those satellite pictures are from like a week after the event oh and they also looked at uh we had if you listen to the the mil the press conferences afterwards mm -hmm. they had 42 planes and 39 boats searching yeah. in the south china sea and in the nicobar island so if you are going to shoot down a plane there's going to be debris everywhere mm -hmm. actually in fact if the debris if the plane crashes in the ocean there's going to be debris everywhere as well mm -hmm. so the same reasons why this plane didn't crash into the south indian ocean also apply to why it wasn't shot down you can't hide all this debris mm -hmm. there's no way to feasibly pull this off mm -hmm. you can't say that all these 13 different countries and all these independent planes that are searching for it are all bought off you know you might be able to say okay the u.s government is covering something up that was what i was maybe even a couple governments right yeah yeah but the problem is like there there's no way that they can quarantine enough area because this mm -hmm. again if it, especially if it's shot down the sky the debris field is going to be tens of miles wide right, right. there's going to be debris everywhere um and that was the biggest problem i had in general with respect to uh, like this the idea that it's either shot down or even if it just crashes you know, and early on, they tried to claim that this plane did some kind of swan dive in the South mm -hmm. Indian Ocean. Which is but really as we know, it's like, yeah, I mean, if you go, crash into the ocean is not any different than crashing into concrete if you're going down at a very high rate of speed, right? It's yeah. not going to just like swoop right through the it. The plane's going to disintegrate. What? Yeah, it's going to blow up and there's going to be pieces everywhere, yeah. right? So really, that's the strongest evidence in general. And I didn't even realize how many planes and boats until I went back and rewatched those press conferences. Mm -hmm. And... To me, what becomes apparent is that they knew it didn't go to the South China Sea. So you were mentioning, oh, they claimed it went towards Vietnam or whatever, mm -hmm. but that was all nonsense. They had military radar that showed it going back over the country and going into the Straits of Malacca. And from that point, like, why are we still searching the South China Sea? Mm -hmm. they, they had a search in the South China Sea for like, I think it was like five or seven days, maybe even up to nine days. Mm -hmm. where they're just wasting time down there. If they had evidence that shows the radar going back over the country, we should have been searching over the Nicobar Islands right away. Right. We should have been searching the South Indian Ocean right away. And they were ob obfuscating that. Like, it did, they have no good answer for it. Mm -hmm. If you watch this interview that was done with the Malaysian Minister of Defense by um, the, I think it was called Lost MH370. Uh, I think it's Four Points. I can't mm -hmm. get that name wrong. But it was an Australian interview that they did with this guy seven weeks later. So mm -hmm. this is like, we should know exactly what's happening. He won't even answer the time at which he was told about the plane going missing. Yeah, there was like, some oh, weird, like all of the press releases say 2.40 a.m. until they suddenly say 1.30 a.m. and don't acknowledge the fact that that changed. It's yeah. very weird. Yeah, so they everything about it's weird. One of the most weird things is when he's questioned about the radar data, he says that, well, we it was an unidentified plane. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, how many planes do you have that are off the radar that are going missing at that? Yeah. Um, also, seven, right? the, the, the biggest issue I had re reading that was, and it might be my bias as an American where we have the, the yeah. trauma of 9-11 still, and an, un, an unresponsive jetliner flying over U.S. airspace is immediately having jets scrambled after it. Uh, it's happened numerous times uh, for less than jetliners. So I look at that and I'm, you know, I have to ask the question, why would Malaysia not scramble at least a couple of their F-16s to go figure out what this plane 
what like ob- yeah. obviously they don't know what it is it's just a blip on their radar so i i, I guess what what what's your thoughts on that you guys definitely need to watch that interview because mm-hmm. um so she asks him about this he says well it was unidentified but why would we send a jet up when we know it's a civilian airliner we know it's not hot we know it's not hostile mm-hmm. and i was like how could you possibly exactly. know how could you not know that? Hostile? the only way would be that you had communication with it and you know that it's an emergency event mm-hmm. because it, otherwise you would have to assume it could be hijacked i mean that was one of the major initiatives plus if it was pilot suicide that's the same as it being hijacked like yeah. you would have to send a jet up just in case you have to shoot it down before they crash into some buildings or something, yeah. right? I found it very weird that it would fly so close to the capital city of Malaysia and nobody thought to shoot it down or even just intercept the thing and ask, what are you doing over the radio or try and signal them or something? I, I know aircraft have other forms of being able to signal than just their radios. I know they're, they, yeah. can, they can flash lights. Like there, there are other options. It's, it's so strange looking at it. That I, I kind of have to agree. They must have known that it was MH370 in order to not scramble jets after it. And he asks her in the interview, why would we send it up? Would you shoot it down? And she's like, well, you said that, not me. And then <laughs> it gets to the point where um, he asks, like, because it's, he says it's not hostile, it's a civilian aircraft, why would we send a jet up? And she goes, to find out where it goes? Yeah, like- <laughs> I just laugh. Like, it's the most, like, how is he even, like, seriously asking that? Of course, because... You don't have to shoot it down. You can just follow it. If you're going to lose track of it, or you don't know like what it yeah. is or, you know, just a risk. Mm-hmm. And then, so he asks, like, um, she asks him, well, why would you shoot it down? And he goes, well, the Americans would like, what? That's the most insensitive statement ever. Like that offended <laughs> me as an American. We would probably follow the thing and we like, might shoot it down if it was headed for New York. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it did. Yeah. I mean, it just, <laughs> very weird like it almost felt like he was evoking 9-11 it, it was just probably yeah, yeah i mean that, that's um, the only thing that he could possibly be referencing because I, I, I know yeah. on the day uh dick cheney gave the order to shoot down any hostile airliners but yeah. that was after attacks had already occurred mm-hmm. and they knew that hijackers were still in the air yeah or at least heavily suspected which at the time it of was the possible. order well and at the time of the order was a correct assumption there mm-hmm. were still flight 93 was still in yeah, the air right. at the time and so you know, it makes sense under those circumstances to give that order. Yeah. But in normal circumstances, at the very least, especially in a post 9-11 world, like you've been saying, Mm -hmm. the baseline should be for any well-functioning military or aerospace just regulation area to, if a plane is unresponsive, get another aircraft in the area. Exactly. For the worst case scenario of if they're just unresponsive and they need help landing or navigating somewhere. Yeah. You yeah, they're all saying common sense stuff. It's like, you know, obviously they like this is how they got painted as incompetent, but mm-hmm. this is one of those rare circumstances where I think you can prove it's maliciousness, right? Because they're yeah. not following anything that's common sense at this point. And he asked, Well, we have all these military procedures. Why would we send up a military jet? I mean, you're gonna send up what else are you gonna send up there? You're gonna send up another civilian airliner? It doesn't make any sense. Of course you're sending a military jet up there. Yeah. Like that's what you should be doing. Yeah, it 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 has to come down to either they they deliberately did not send anything after it because they knew something or they you know they were completely incompetent and i don't know which one is actually worse for the malaysian government from a pr standpoint i I mean i I think obviously one issue was that malaysian airlines which was 70 percent government owned was going bankrupt and this was a disaster for them but obviously if it if it passed over malaysia without them scrambling any jets after it that does imply that they knew what it was it also flew over Thailand, and yeah. like the the path they had laid it's out, it would have yeah. flown over Thailand, and Thailand didn't didn't scramble anybody. I, there were a lot of commenters who were like, "Well, why would Malaysia scramble fighters if it was over Cambodia?" And I was like, "That's not what I was saying. Mm. <laughs> I was saying yeah. why wouldn't Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, if it was over their airspace and unresponsive, why wouldn't they scramble aircraft?" Uh, so it's all very strange. But that brings us down to to those videos, and okay. having watched them, uh, I don't know anything about how our surveillance satellites work uh what i've been able to gather is that we do have a pair of spy satellites that fly over that that region as part of their orbit and that it they were in the area at the time that you were able to prove that um oh yeah the question i would have then is i uh, you know with with respect to specifically the location of everything going down. If this is over the Nicobar Islands, that's obviously between Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. And I think 
to the northwest would be what? Uh, Bangladesh? No, my geography is not great at the moment, but yeah, yeah you, you may be Bangladesh correct, or yeah, India. But, um, yeah, I mean, India's pretty far over there, but yeah, I think we're dealing with like Indonesia's nearby. Myanmar. And- Myanmar, okay. Yeah, sure. It would have been, I think, Myanmar at that point. Yeah. So but yeah, maybe parts of India too, because there's a base there on the, those islands in the Nicobar Islands that we think <laughs> where the drone was deployed from. That's like a U.S. co joint with India. So. Yeah. So that that was the question I had. The the spy satellites I can absolutely get down with. We we have a network of them. We know they're there. They this is what they're for essentially. Is oh cool. <laughs> yeah. You, you guys want to see? So let's yeah, sure. Show us. Satellite. Um. So this is the recreation that we did. You can use Mm -hmm. amateur trajectories that are available on the internet to look at the satellites. And initially, when I thought we were in the South Indian Ocean here, I I thought these had to be the satellite pair because we're seeing this 3D stereoscopic imagery in the satellite video. Mm -hmm. And so you see these two satellites are next to each other. This is USA-229, also Mm -hmm. known as NRL-34. Okay. It was sent up in 2011. It's got two satellites right next to each other here. One of them is officially classified as debris. Mm-hmm. So you can see the time in the top of the screen as well. Okay. So you can see here at this point here, we're, the, we're already within range sure of the plane, right? Gotcha. This plane is kind of where my mouse is flying over this way here. Okay. This All is right. again, according to the military radar. So this is 2.37 AM local time. Yeah. And so when we get to about 2.40 AM here, this is now the time where there's this um, anomaly in the Imersat mm-hmm. data where we just see zero rows of zeros in mm-hmm. the Imersat data. There's a witness right about right where my mouse is down here on mm-hmm. a boat. And she sees the plane as okay. well around this exact time as well. And we've shown we got these spy satellites staring right down. All right. So, you know, this is the smoking gun that says there's no chance in hell that the U.S. government wasn't watching this plane. And what's special about this location and time, this is the time and location where supposedly the plane turned into the South Indian Ocean. Mm-hmm. So if this plane turned into the South Indian Ocean, they watched it turn into the South Indian Ocean and they would know for sure. Right. And if it's our videos, then they know for sure that one of those videos is probably using data from these satellites right mm-hmm. here because we've got the satellites right in the region. And these are low Earth orbit satellites. Okay. So these are satellites that are going to be able to get a very high resolution in their infrared cameras so, relative to like geostationary ones, which are like yeah. 40 times further away. So what's the, uh, what's the altitude for a low Earth orbit satellite? Yeah, about a thousand kilometers between 900 and 1100 kilometers versus okay. 40,000 kilometers for geostationary ones, which usually stay in one location. Gotcha. Um, and this is part of the reason why I thought NRL 32, which is a geostationary satellite in the mm-hmm. South Indian Ocean, would have been the one taking our videos early on. Right. Until someone corrected me and said, those are 40,000 kilometers away. Those would be looking straight down. Yeah. Um, and that's just too far away. You need like a Hubble telescope to be able to pull that kind of gotcha. resolution off. Really? Now, jump on in yeah yeah i was gonna say so really quickly for those who haven't seen them or aren't familiar uh you know explicitly with the videos i don't know if you want to pull them up yeah you can pull, least, oh, there we yeah. go perfect i figured you'd be more Here's prepared satellite than video. <laughs> so yep. this is uh our satellite from the regicide and non-account it says okay. described received march 12th 2014 in the description okay it was published and this was published like right away May right 19th. yeah well may 19th so about 70 days later The question here is why did they upload it but not publish it potentially? Or did they lie about the description? If you think Mm -hmm. that they hoaxed it, then if you think these videos are fake, you pretty much have to come up with a reason why Regicide Anon was in on it. They would have had to have been in on it. Otherwise, there's no reason for them to lie about the received date. And if you look at this, and even if you go by the 72 days, this is really, really narrow window of time to be making two CGI videos. So these videos side by side are not duplicated. This is a stereoscopic imagery. Okay. Meaning we've actually turned this into a 3D video. And I'll just prove that real quick. I'll, I'll switch back. Mm-hmm. We turned it into a 3D video. You can actually watch this in 3D. Okay. So, so this is them layered right on top of each other. Pretty much. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's what this proves. And this proves as well. We've proven there's a parallax effect. If mm-hmm. you were to flip between the two screens very quickly, you can actually see parallax as well. Okay. Um, so at least this video that we're looking at is parallax. And there's that little mouse. black dot was the mouse. Yeah, that was right. the mouse. Now, whenever the screen moves, mm-hmm. that actually updates these coordinates. Uh, is this the full screen? That's not the full screen. It says mini this player, is... yeah. Let me see. Uh, oh, here, this is the full screen. Yep. So there's some coordinates in the bottom left. And, and well, as well in the bottom left, there is a de- satellite designation. There's a mm-hmm. higher quality version of this video that is, doesn't show the stereoscopic effect mm-hmm. that lets you see NROL 22. 
Okay. This is important because there's a Newsweek and France 24 debunk out there that's objectively wrong. All right. Where the only fact in that debunk says NRL 33, which was sent up to, in 2015 or late 2014. Mm -hmm. But this does not say NRL 2033. It says NRL 22, okay. which was sent up in 2006. So that debunk is false. People post it all the time. It's incorrect. Just goes to show you that the level of conspiracy that's involved in hiding these videos Mm -hmm. We can see this orb come flying in. I think you right. saw that orb come flying in. It was coming at like Mach 3. And it ricochets and it starts to rotate around the plane here. Okay. Now notice we've got this smoke coming out of the back of the plane here. Mm -hmm. This is this plane is very low. These are cumulus clouds here. Mm -hmm. They only form at low altitudes. And uh, contrails only form at high altitudes. 18,000, okay. 30,000 feet. So this is has to be either smoke or exhaust. We believe it has to be smoke. We don't think we'd be able to see the exhaust like this, mm -hmm. and then this pattern that sticks out there like that. So, so what video, what altitude do you are you suggesting this is then? Based on the witnesses nearby, it's less than ten thousand feet. Based on the clouds here, we're probably dealing with like five to seven thousand feet. Okay. But again, it's estimated because we don't have a we don't have like exact like three D. We can't look at it and tell you know how above how far above these clouds it really mm -hmm. is. We kind of because we have kind of a, a perspective here issue, but it's got to be close to them. Okay. So we can see this first orb come flying in, possibly, possibly Mach 3. Looks like it's just ignoring gravity. It's moving at an extremely high rate of speed. Mm -hmm. We're going to see this second orb. And Mach, shoot up Mach 3 up. is three times well over down. three times the uh, maximum speed. Yeah, over 2,000 miles an hour. It's yeah, going yeah. really, really fast. This Four times the maximum speed almost. Yeah. This plane's turning uh, in a standard turning formation, mm -hmm. uh, like making a left turn, excuse me, and it is descending. Okay. And if it was not descending, it actually would be going beyond the capabilities of the 777-200. But because it's turning and descending, it's basically maxing those, those capabilities. So mm -hmm. whoever would have made this somehow had the exact perfect capabilities of a 777-200, which according mm -hmm. to the VFX experts of Mar um, uh, Top Gun Maverick, <laughs> was even better than they did. And that was mm -hmm. the movie was made in 2022. Right. So this came out in 2014. Now we see the second orb fly up through the clouds mm -hmm. and now it's next to it. And a third orb comes flying in. Right. We think we're looking at essentially ball lightning, plasma balls here. Mm -hmm. So there is an object inside these that is creating a field okay. that's allowing them to achieve zero mass and be completely like weightless, hoverless. No gravity mm -hmm. is affecting these orbs. And they're able to create their own geodesics where they are hovering and, and able to pull themselves forward. There's no propulsion behind them. Mm -hmm. They're in this perfect triangle pattern that's exactly 120 degrees. Uh, and somebody mentioned that this is equivalent to like a zero point pattern of uh, like a circuit or something, I think it was. Um, this is a perfect uh, sinusoidal pattern um, as well. So when you if you were to map this on a graph, it's a, it's a wave pattern, perfect wave pattern. To me, is too exact for anyone to be flying these. Mm -hmm. It has to be programmed. It has to be automatic. Now, I say AI, but I'm going to back away from that and just say basically it's a computer program, targeting program, however you would want to think of it. Right. You see this pattern that is forming around the plane here. Mm -hmm. It's encircling the plane. If you were to scrunch time down, it would be making a sphere around the plane at this point. To me, okay. that's mapping the plane. There's definitely some purpose here that's happening, though. So Again, you think it's scanning the plane to create a live 3D image of basically, yeah, basically. what they're dealing with? The okay. center is the center of mass of the plane as well, like perfectly. Okay. Now, once it gets to this point here, we, again, we can see this mouse. Mm -hmm. When this mouse moves across the screen, it doesn't update the coordinates. The coordinates only update when the perspective changes. And so they're using another analog, like a middle mouse button or like a trackball or like one of those mm -hmm. nips that you have in the laptops to move the perspective around separate mm -hmm. from the mouse moving. Okay. This mouse also shows 24 frames per second when it moves. Mm -hmm. And the background is six frames per second. Right. So now we already have a bunch of things that indicate this is not fake. Like, why would all this stuff be built into it that's fake? Mm -hmm. this, this 24 frames per second on the mouse is uh, indicative of a Citrix session, meaning that this is potentially somebody actually logged into the real spy satellite database, mm -hmm. taking a screen recording that they've cropped mm -hmm. because the mouse goes off the screen to the top right goes off the screen to the bottom left. Mm -hmm. This isn't being filmed by a camera, not being filmed by a camera phone. This is a situation where somebody's actually screen recording. It also means they almost certainly got caught. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're not going to screen record something on a Pentagon computer and have no, them not know, caught, right? <laughs> yeah. So now they the caught Snowden and, and he didn't even do that. Yeah, exactly. So when I started realizing that, I'm like, whoa, this person definitely got caught. This is no way that they mm -hmm. got away with this. Um, the pattern changes on the orbs here. Now it's vertical. 
So it's almost like it's preparing you for what's about to happen. When it gets to where mm -hmm. my mouse is right here, we're going to see this main event where it happens with our plane. I'm going to try to pause it at the right time. We'll see it's how good I am. It's very hard to pause it at the right time. I've tried. Ooh, look at that. Oh, wow. So, perfect pause. Mm -hmm. Now we see this zap happen here. This zap is accurately illuminating the clouds. These are very detailed volumetric clouds here. Mm -hmm. It's illuminating the clouds in the foreground and in the background, and the clouds that are further away don't get illuminated at all. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to Bob Green here today, trying to get a better understanding of this. Mm -hmm. I think there's a few ways to understand it. Right now, my best understanding is that the electrons are being energized in the surrounding area by mm -hmm. this zap going off. And that's why we see this flash happen. Okay. Notice there's no there's no shadows anywhere mm -hmm. in any of these. The, the plane's not casting a shadow on the clouds, even though it goes right over it. Mm -hmm. And the zap as well is all the, it's pretty bright. So we think this is proof as well that what we're looking at is nighttime. This is okay. a full color IR. So it's mm -hmm. infrared. We see more white on the top of the clouds because the top of the clouds has more infrared radiation coming off of them okay and it's so all this this would be infrared color. where cold is dark and hot is not necessarily light? in the false color it's not doesn't work that way okay in the false color they can pretty much set it however they want so actually this is actually going to end up being a cold endothermic event when we look at it in the in the thermal camera and the, the um mq1c gray eagle in a second mm -hmm. And so really, this is more of just a situation where they've got it set to look like it's daytime so mm -hmm. that when somebody's an operator, it's just it's not for like very high detailed like thermal mapping. It's more mm -hmm. for just tracking objects. Right. The purpose of this system, we believe it's called Sibbers, mm -hmm. is to track planes, boats, missiles, mm -hmm. uh, battlefield intelligence and battlefield awareness, like a battlefield map. OK, this is most likely a computer generated program that mm -hmm. uses satellite data from all over the world that you can just log in like Google earth and you okay. can say, pull up this area and they can do this in real time or they can do it playback if they want. This is probably why they don't have to follow you in cars anymore. Like anywhere you are on the planet, they can just pull up video recording of where you're at. I mean, look, we can see the, the ocean here. So right. um, highly, highly, the resolution here is really strong. Mm -hmm. And this is also part of the reason why there's no atmospheric interference. And this is what something that came up with the Trump picture. Mm -hmm. There was a Trump picture that was uh, released on social media in 2019, and people didn't think it was real because it looked similar to this, but it was brighter, and it was just a still image like this. And people thought, well, how could that come be coming from a satellite? Because they would have to, um, and, th and the plane's gone here now. They would have to be removing somehow the atmospheric interference. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. The answer is pretty simple: is that this is a computer program, and also that is reason why it's six frames per second is the reason why it's six frames per second here is because it's a huge battlefield computer generated map. Yeah. The well, wider your screen is, the less frame rate you're going to get. So why, I get, the, the first thing that sticks out to me that I would ask you is why would the cloud, the clouds don't appear to be moving. Yeah, so they actually do move. It's just not as simple as that because we're pulling data from outer space. Mm -hmm. So it's a thousand kilometers away. So if you were to go outside and look at the clouds, they're not going to look like they're moving very fast right. either. If you get really close, they look like they're really mo they're moving fast. And that's only a few miles away. These yeah. are a thousand miles away or a thousand kilometers away. Gotcha. So there actually is proof that they do move. It's just very, very slight. Um, let me see if I can pull that up. Yeah. You can watch the clouds move in this one. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, this isn't really the best one to see it, but they jiggle a little bit here. Okay, this is not really working that great, but <laughs> I've got an imager one that kind of loops it and it's easier to see, but these clouds jiggle a little bit left and right. They, in this. I can see it. Yeah. It's very yeah, faint, so, but I can see it. Even the debunkers agree that the clouds move as well. It's mm -hmm. just that it's very slight and hard to see. Right. Um, and also the perspective changes eight times. So it's not a situation where we're looking at the same perspective for over a minute. Each perspective shift is only about eight seconds long. Mm -hmm. So that makes that very difficult to see. Gotcha. Now I want to show you this Sibbers thing too, because I also struggled with this idea of why are the satellites not moving faster? And it's again, because we've got a 3D battlefield space. So if you check this out, take a look at how they're scanning the earth here. These are your geostationary yeah. satellites. Look at all the scanning happening. Look how wide these scans are. Yeah. So this is actually a publicly available video from Lockheed Martin. And that one didn't even show the low Earth orbit satellites. Mm -hmm. These are actually the Millennia satellites, which we think are the command satellites that are relaying the information using the SIGINT system, sure. which is basically like an internet for signals intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and it just passes data around. And you can see these scanners here. I mean, look at these scans that these are doing. 
And so the low Earth orbit satellites are much closer. Right. And so those are going to be your ones that are going to probably get the very high quality imagery that we would be seeing from our videos, mm -hmm. from the 370 videos. But again, check this out. I mean, to me, this is pretty much proof that what we're looking at is a system where you're not logged into one satellite looking at the one satellite. You're going to be looking at this computer program that pulls all the satellite data together for you, right? Right. We believe this system probably started at the same time that NROL 22 went up. They may have had a, like a, a legacy system before that, mm -hmm. but NROL 22 went up in 2006. So it was probably one of the first ones okay. that really had this like very advanced imagery that we see from these. Um, gotcha. Now, I can show the Trump satellite picture just real quick. When you say the Trump satellite picture. Yeah, I'll show you. You'll understand once I show it to you. <laughs> yeah. So this is the Trump satellite picture here. Okay. Uh, you see it? Yeah. So you see that this looks very similar to the picture that we, uh, what, what I was just showing in terms of perspective here, high mm -hmm. resolution, bigger difference here is that you can see this huge shadow mm -hmm. casting from the tower right here. Okay. And it's a lot brighter than ours as well. So Trump posted this on social media. It was a big no, no because <laughs> satellite data and imagery like this basically never leaks to the public uh -huh. before this, as far as I can tell, the last time it happened was like the eighties. Yeah, I have uh, I have a a relative who used to work for JPL, um, and and he I I won't go further than saying he's he's told me some things about the capabilities of our satellites that are utterly terrifying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I know JPL is not is not NASA. They just build the rockets, but they have all the same security clearances. So uh, that's just to be clear. That's where I'm coming from on that. Um, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that because I don't know how much of it I'm actually supposed to be allowed to share here, but I was told this when I was a child. So, um, but yeah, so I, I can see, and, and this is going to be my skepticism coming through. Uh, I can, I can definitely see the satellite data. I, I have no reason to believe that's fake. I also, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in it, but that seems the satellite one is the most compelling evidence to me of what you're suggesting with this, this disappearance of the aircraft. Uh, the, the thermal imaging video, however, I would ask why there would be the drone in the area at that time. Is the suggestion that it was a drone that was scrambled when the plane dropped off radar? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so why does Malaysia not send up planes, right? We were just talking about it. Yeah. Here's your answer is U S government had it under control, right? So U S government says we will deploy our drone MQ one C gray Eagle. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is MQ-1C Great Eagle. This is camera housing that we're seeing above it here. Okay. This is exactly what these drones look like. You can actually find a video, a mm -hmm. picture of an MQ-1C with a camera on the both wings, just mm -hmm. like this as well. We this is using an advanced electro IR camera, probably okay. produced by Raytheon, is what we've found. They, they produce these multi-spectral cameras. Mm -hmm. They actually film in IR, which would be our FLIR, you know. But yeah, this is at a thermal layer added using the software. Okay. Somebody actually posted, first of all, they DM'd me and they also actually posted in one of the podcasters chats that I did an interview with, said that their friend is an expert that builds these drones and they mm -hmm. asked them for general atomics. Okay. And this is what their drones look like as well. So we actually have a testimony out there by someone who, uh, I don't know if it's, they, they're willing to like really go out and like put their neck on the line, but right. they claim that their friend works for general atomics. So again, this is verifiable information that we would we'd be able to talk to general atomics. They would be able to confirm this is what mm -hmm. the drones look like. Um, and so, yes, this drone doesn't move as fast as the plane does. So this would have to intercept it. Right. So this drone, most likely, because this plane's going south into the east, mm -hmm. this drone is to the north. It was just cropped out of our satellite picture. Right. Which tells us that the person that leaked that picture was not trying to damage the U.S. intelligence. Also, mm -hmm. if this was a hoax video, why are you cropping out the drone that you're creating your second video of? Wouldn't you sure. have that like right in there as well? So all of this indicates to like real intent, not fake intent, but just real intent. Mm -hmm. And now we, we looked at this and we can see these clouds here. They look not as detailed as the clouds before because we've got this thermal layer added over the top. Right. We were actually able to strip the thermal layer and you can see more detail in the clouds as well. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go ahead and watch this. Now, this is a separate angle. We're so, looking at it from the side now. Get, get it really quick. So in, in this, it looks like... Blue is cold, green and red are hot. Red gets hotter, white's okay. going to be hot, and black's going to be cold here. All right. So that's going to be very important because we're about to see some really anomalous stuff. 
this drone is actually very close to the plane too. If this was like, you know, commercial craft, you would never get this close. Mm -hmm. So we've already got evidence this is an operation. When I talked okay. to Chris Leto, he thought it looked like a weapons test. This was the first time when he looked at it. All right. The second time when I looked at it with him, you know, I think his perspective changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. We can see this smoke still. We can see someone's manually tracking the plane with right. this drone. They're not automatically tracking it. We can see the box here yeah. as well and, and focusing in. Um, and the plane goes off the screen. So if this was a fake video, you're, you're faking it with like manual tracking built yeah. into your fake video. It doesn't make a lot of sense either. Normally, mm -hmm. when you see a fake video, it's like the cameras, the, like the UFO is like right in the middle of the screen right. as the camera moves, et cetera, right? Could be somebody anticipating that somebody would have claimed the video is fake, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's there's a lot of stuff that would be required yeah. for this to be fake, including what we see now is these trails, but they're not trails. They're actually in front of the orbs, pulling okay. the orbs forward here. Okay. These are fields as well. So now we can see clearly this is a ball of plasma or, mm -hmm. you know, there's a field around it here. Bob it's something Rainier, warm. Yeah. And it's a little bit warm. As we get closer, you're going to see that there's a heat signature in it too. Bob Greenier has dug into this and he's shown me now just today, even that these would potentially be uh, fractal toroidal uh, mm -hmm. objects, toroidal moments in them, which really, if you break it down for layman's per terms, it's like you're creating a, uh, 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 what is the right word for it here? Mm -hmm. um, a structure that is essentially such where it can magnify and, and force an electrical current mm -hmm. to get trapped between magnetic fields. And this can create a force that's so powerful that it can cause it to completely separate itself from what we would think of as space time. So that this field is where we see the interaction. Um, I'm trying to remember the names of all this stuff. It's been a long day. Uh, but this is the, the, the distortion point between the space time and where this plasma field is kind of uh, originating from. Mm -hmm. And what this allows for is actually there to be a perfect, uh, I'm forgetting all the right terminology here right now This for this, but it's in a situation where it's, it's stable, where mm -hmm. it's not going to like dissipate or anything like that. These can theoretically uh, go between any type of medium. It can go through space or water. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe even solid mass, theoretically. Okay. So watch, though, as these... It's harder to see in this version. Um, so I'm just going to switch real quick to this version where we removed the thermal layer. And you can see these trails much clearer in terms of they're going in for, front of these orbs. Right? Okay. You, you can watch it very clearly here. How did you strip the thermal layer? So somebody on Reddit actually stripped the thermal layer. They use software to strip the thermal layer. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a short clip from it. Like I have the full long one as well. Right. If you'd want to go along with it. So you can tell it's the same video. It's just has yeah. this thermal layer strip, which is really probably just messing with the color channels. Probably. And things like that, right? Yeah. So out, um, out of curiosity, uh, with yeah. the, the position of the camera on the plane, on, yeah. an, on, an, on the MQ-1C Grey Eagle, what, not the plane, the, the drone, drone, where would this camera be mounted? Yeah, so these are on the wings. You can find, if you Google the MQ-1C, there's a picture that has the cameras right on the wings. Okay. You... And that's, we don't think that's the wing that you can see there. But if you go Google it, you can, uh, I mean, I can Google one for you as well. Yeah, Aiden's, Aiden's um, pulling one up for me on the, uh... Yeah, and then there's one picture in there where you can see where it's got the camera in the middle, and it's got two cameras, one on mm -hmm. either wing as well. Okay. And then what you've seen here is probably the housing right above the cameras. All um, right. Yeah. And yeah, so these Raytheon cameras have software built into them where you can add these thermal layers as well over the top. It's going to be a custom setting where you're going to be able to add it yourself and choose what the, the setting is here gotcha. for what's hot and what's cold. So can, can just really quickly again, I, I'm not okay. trying to sidetrack. I'm just trying to I'm trying to place the camera on the plane in my own mind. Can you go back to the, the shot where we can see part of the drone? Yeah. Yeah. So what is that part on the left? This here, this is the nose of the plane. That's of the, the nose of the plane. All right, so what we would be looking at here is this would be the, the camera mounted on the right wing. Find one. Yeah, this is going to be the right wing. Yeah. Okay, exactly. so it's camera mounted on the right wing, which means that at this point, it is headed towards, it is following the plane, and yep. it would be turning left with the plane to keep the camera tracking? Yeah, it's like goes underneath this smoke trail, right, and it's following the plane a okay. little bit. I've got a picture somewhere that kind of shows it, but you can you can kind of tell. Um, let me share. I'll switch shared screen real quick to something else. It would also and, imagine, considering it's traveling, it, it's crossing the rotor or not the rotor wash, but the exhaust wash that it is also okay. descending with it as well. Because if, yeah, so if it, it's descending mm -hmm. in the satellite imagery, then that's also descending with it to follow. Gotcha. Yeah, and here's where you can see these cameras are right. So mm -hmm. what we're seeing is the camera housing probably right above it. Gotcha. Uh, as you can see in this picture right here. 
So this is the, we looked at other drones as well. Like some people argue, maybe it's the MQ nine C, which is a much more advanced model that can you, go a lot faster and further. But this is the only one I can find yeah. that has these cameras on the wings like this. You would think so they would design it so the camera housing wasn't visible through the camera. But yeah, you would think so too. But I, I guess not. Um, maybe the newer ones don't don't have yeah. that situation. We also think this might be like a specialized version that is yeah. specifically for these types of events for high intelligence, right? Because a lot of the other ones have like missiles. Yeah. And stuff I'm like pretty that. sure I've been killed by a few of these in Call of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I don't know about the one with cameras on it, but yeah. Maybe <laughs> Probably not the one with cameras. But all right. So, uh, so again, I'll, I'll go back yeah, to show, where we're at here. Yeah, so show us. So it zooms in here. And again, it goes off the screen here, and this person zooms in once it goes off the screen, and that's why it stays off the screen like this. Mm -hmm. So again, this is another thing: like, why are you faking this like zoom as well? Right. Also, how are you faking this heat signature in the belly of the plane? Yeah. This is right where the landing gear are. Okay. And what we found is there's two AC heat exhaust ports on either side of the plane, right where the landing gear are, right here. And All you right. can kind of see the smoke right here next to the back of the plane that's much higher than where the engines are here, which indicates that this smoke is probably coming from the plane. It's probably getting kind of stuck up against the edge of the plane, the hull of the plane, and then makes those smoke trails that we see as it comes off the back. So okay. this is where we thought, okay, wow, this is actually showing the fire. There's a witness down there as well mm -hmm. that sees the plane, same thing, descending, flying low with black smoke coming out of the back of it that's glowing orange. All right. The glowing orange effect would be from fighting a fire using the Halon fire extinguishing devices for a very long period of time where the whole plane has got this bromine uh, gas filling mm -hmm. it up. And so it's causing it to glow orange because that's what this bromine gas is a halogen. Okay. So it's going to be glowing orange and it's pitch black out as well. So she's probably only able to see a lot of this because there's some tiny amount of illumination coming from the plane where in the pitch black night, it allows it to stand out. So you can see these orbs here, and you can see the half circle um, heat signature on them. Uh -huh. And this is as well what uh, Bob Green here was telling me, that this, this really shows this fractal toroidal moments effect, where inside here you've got rot or, or how do they call it, a, tor a toroid. A toroid looks like a donut, pretty much. And you've got stacking toro toroids on top of toroids, which are uh, these donuts, and then you make a donut shape out of the donuts themselves. And so you get to a point where you've got this donut and then the inner point is basically the focus point of the electromagnetic signatures of essentially being able to produce gravity waves. Um, and so this will then create a magnifying effect where you can get a very powerful force here that will allow you to, in essence here, create this, this track, these patterns that we are seeing. Okay. And it's real, real uh, quick, going back to yeah, the, the donuts of the donuts thing, I just want to make sure that I understand entirely. I'm glad what? you're asking questions yeah, because yeah, I am so yeah, out yeah, of yeah. my depth at this point. So what what material or substance would be comprising those donuts? Yes, yeah, so if you look at tor toroidals, you'll see the like examples of this in Google, which are these like donuts where in some of these it's a like, um, I, I can't remember what uh, pat uh, material he said you could use on those. But again, I've got to be an electrical engineer to understand some of this, but there are certain metals and materials that are the ones that are going to be better for using this. Um, I don't remember from my interview with him earlier today what he said. Uh, but whatever materials that they use are specific ones that are like either based for better induction or better insulation, not entirely sure. Uh, so, but the point here is that if you pass an electric current through it, supposedly it'll just start to like uh, uh, collect within there. Okay. And you can create a point where it, uh, man, I wish I was better at the electrical engineering and the science side of this, honestly. I'm a historian. Um, I have no idea what's going yeah. on. Yeah, I'm just- I've been uh, trying to get better at it. This is the stuff I'm the worst at, honestly, is the science side. <laughs> no, that's I'm fine, just yeah. I, I'm right? just a, I'm a hobby physicist, you know, a, a yeah, total yeah. like, you know, armchair physicist. So I'm just like curious, cause I know I was, I've been doing a lot of electrical engineering like research recently, because to me, uh, it's magic. It, it is, the, yeah. the electrical yeah, yeah. engineering yeah. is so confusing and it's Led. like, the fact that it is as complex as it is is amazing. And the fact that we have an electrical grid, we're able to do things of this level of complexity, like having this call right now is insane. But the yeah, I, is what yeah, but I People just wasn't sure. Yeah. Uh, so I wasn't so I sure. They were listening to the podcast earlier. So apparently lithium okay. is one of the ones that you can use. And yeah, it's like an gotcha. electromagnet basically is what it's be able to produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And apparently if you stack these on and you just keep doing this pattern. So you make a donut and you turn the donuts into donuts and then you turn that donut into more donuts. You get to a point where these fields overlap over one another 
and it gets to a point of, I don't know if amplification or magnification is the right word, but it gets to a point essentially where you can then allow the object to completely disp disp uh, disperse itself or separate itself from space time as we think of it to create a zero mass situation for the plane. And when you've obtained zero mass, now you can just float. Now you can ignore gravity. And that's why we see these things going at Mach 3. And this is the part where I think, wow, okay, this is also explains like UAPs, UFOs, and how those can theoretically fly. But it doesn't feel like what we're looking at here is UFOs. It feels more like, I mean, technically they are, they're unidentified flying objects, but <laughs> yeah. um, it feels like it's like we were able to look at that and like we figured out how it works and then we made our own like versions of it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what it looks like when we see these things spinning around. Yeah. So so take us through, just because we're, we're getting very close to when we need to switch to the Q&A session. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Take us sure. through and show us, because this is the last thing I want to talk about before we switch over, because obviously this is the, the that right there is the one that everybody's claiming has been debunked. And and I, I've seen, sure. I, I watched, I, obviously, the Some Ordinary Gamers video is the one that gets shared around the most, because Muda is the, one of the bigger people in the space. And I, I, I've i been watching him for years. I have a lot of respect for the guy. I He seems to generally be a pretty honest guy. So I I looked at it, the 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 video effects pack from literally from the nineties, I think it was that, uh, it was suggested this was from. Yeah. And I will say that first, if you pull it back to the, the beginning of it, um, uh, maybe pause it like right, right when it really forms. Oh yeah. Oh, well, I've got the other ones we'll look at. Too yeah. Right there. Well. Yeah. That first so frame see, was it. like what three or four different clear shapes that happen here. Right. Yeah, there, that, there, that first there, one. And so we've got at least four frames, five different frames there. I think that we're seeing. Yeah. So this VFX came from a guy named Mick West. Okay. And he's a guy who dishonestly debunks real videos all the time. He doesn't have any credibility whatsoever. So um, can can you give an example of, of something we could look into? Yeah, you can look into the DOD Navy. The, the, the videos that were declassified and proven to be real, mm -hmm. he's one of the people that debunked them and continues to try to debunk them even after the Navy has gone out and admitted that they're real and declassified them. Mm -hmm. So that automatically should debunk, like discredit him completely. But I'm gonna go ahead and just finish the job. Sure. So first of all, here, this is the one that they claim matches. Yeah, that was the one that really looked back. close to me. Yeah, they look similar because what they've done is they've resized this effect to uh -huh. try to match it over the top of this, and they don't show you the left hand side again here because it wouldn't match. Okay. And also, you can see that even though they're similar, it doesn't actually match 100%. You can see that these edges don't match here. You can see there's a ton of dots missing here as well. They found mm -hmm. one thing that looks similar. So what they did here was they ran a program to try to look for something that's similar to this because there's no way that he found a random 90s video game, 3DO video game yeah. graphic in one day. I've got him on record multiple times claiming mm -hmm. he wouldn't look into the videos. Okay. And all of a sudden in one day, he figures it out in the same day that a sock puppet account named Icy Slide posts it. That mm -hmm. is a one day old account that has to get manual approval. The middle part isn't even close to the same. Mm -hmm. You can see there's all this extra stuff coming out of our real pattern. You can even see part of the plane here yeah. coming out. You can see this middle effect is a white zap. It's not even close to the same color. It doesn't have the same color effects. Mm -hmm. We've got these little lines coming out of the side of it here as well. So if anyone thinks these match, and I'm just going to say this is a statement of fact, they do not match. Okay. What if was the program, by the way? Color, the video game or? Uh, yeah, the, the VFX program. They claim it comes from a video game called Killing Time, which is a 90s video game uh, that is from a 3DO uh, thing, I guess, of whatever game console. Okay. And so the idea here is that somebody ran a program to find something that was similar. They falsify the image and change the size of it. It doesn't have any of the blue stuff in the background that shows natural interference pattern. Even if this matched, it wouldn't debunk any of the rest of the videos. So again, trying to match one frame Mm -hmm. and say that this somehow debunks it and proves that this asset's used is extremely dishonest. If you were to try to move the pixels around here, it would probably mm -hmm. take you days to flip them around. And plus, keep in mind, it's not like a situation where you're copying something to compare it to something else. If right. we were to move the pixels around here, that's not how it would have worked in, in the real world. They would have had to manually move these around without comparing it to anything. So it would be like trying to do a puzzle without knowing what the puzzle looks like. So... If you can move these around, so like this would be the challenge. Take this visual effect here. Don't have the background to compare it to and try to move all the pixels around blindly until you get it to match the exactly the one that we see in the background here. You'd never be able to pull it off because this isn't where it comes from. But just to be 100% sure, we've got the actual VFX, the full VFX. And 
Once you see the full VFX, the illusion breaks down entirely and you can tell that this is just simple disinformation. Um, so let me switch over to the other one. So as a statement of fact, even on that single frame, it does not match. And it would take a minimum of hours. And that was if you're comparing it to something you can already see. Mm -hmm. If you superimpose the whole visual effect over our video, you can tell it's not even close. Yeah, they would have had it, it would it, it would basically mean they had to mix several VFX. This is not even remotely yeah. close. And now we're talking about a situation where like less than 1% of the pixels match. Yeah. The first so, one is probably less than 10% of the pixels. So if anyone claims that this matches, and this is the frame right here where they say it matches, which mm -hmm. we can see it doesn't, all you have to ask them is how many pixels match? And then the argument's over. Yeah. Because no one, no one to date, I've asked hundreds of people, no one will even answer that question. Now, if you're a VFX expert, and you're some kind of expert at VFX, tell me how many pixels match here. Yeah. Just tell me. Just you, you must have some programs, right, where you can do it real quickly mm -hmm. and tell me how many pixels match. Yeah. Yeah, so what you're going to find out is it's going to be like maybe less than half, maybe less than 10%. So, so the only, coming from a film background, yeah, so, what are your thoughts? So me as a you know filmmaker, I'm currently a uh, director and producer of commercials. I went to school for film, things like that. So what I will say hey, here Don't sell yourself short. It was Tish. <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, <laughs> but so, you know, one of the things that, that comes to mind, specifically why I was asking about like what program it was and things like that is, so for this, if someone wanted to match uh, this video, um, what I'm seeing is compared to the, the example that you have, uh, it seems like if they wanted to do that with the original footage, uh, they would have to, you know, isolate the color channels and re-augment them so that way they fit the, um, the thermal layer. Uh, and then obviously they would have to drop uh, some of those color layers that they have in there in the original, specifically like the oranges and things like that, and then just, you know, kind of invert the other elements. Um, the one thing that I'm thinking here is less that they took the old footage and repurposed it directly, but uh, there's a number of different programs for After Effects in particular, uh, and Cinema 4D and things can get even more complex, but there's things like uh, Particulate, there's a lot of other things where you can kind of plug in a, uh, you know, Turbulent Displace is one element that is similar to that, but not quite that effect. Um, but there's a couple of different plugins and a couple of different actions within After Effects that you can do to create something similar to that. I think if if it were to have been fake, it would have been somebody was inspired by that original clip and then tried to recreate that within the thermal coloring uh, to have a similar effect style. I don't think they would have manipulated that original footage. Now, that being said, it's a very obscure thing to replicate. Uh, so it would have, you know, it would have been an interesting choice to have been made. So there's definitely credence to the idea that, you know, it'd be really weird to have faked in that regard. Um, but I would be curious to see somebody put together in After Effects uh, how they would go about doing that. Because uh, I know there's a, a few different ways in which that's possible. Uh, and I'd be curious to see compared to the thermal footage that you have and then the comparison footage, how close they can get to both of them. That'd be an interesting uh, experiment at the very least. Yeah, and I so you hit the nail on the head there. I think the part where you said that you would have to comp have it, you have to look at it and be comparing it to something, right? That's what my mind rules that out. Sure, if you had infinite time and you're, you know, like your master, you're trying to copy a masterpiece, then sure, you could move those pixels around. You could use After Effects to get it to blend together. And actually, somebody tried to do that and show how you could use After Effects to change it and shadow it to be black. Realize, though, that that's not what this is. This is an original work. These were not videos that were already out there that you were able to compare them to. And so that's what I've countered with is, well, if you look at our list of requirements here, one of the ones right at the top is no reference to copy from. It would be a completely original work. And that's the part where it, it completely throws out the VFX debunk. Because at that point now, it's not a situation where you're moving those pixels around to get it to match. You would have to use that as an original work and add it in there, which at that point, why are you modifying it? You, what you would have done is you would have used that exact effect and you wouldn't be changing it. You would just input it into your, into your video. Also keep in mind, we had the corridor crew look at this or the corridor crew looked at this in the Danny Jones podcast, which is going to come live, go live pretty soon. I've got a sneak peek at it. I've already debunked every single claim they made. And when they looked at it, they even admitted the videos are perfect. There's been hundreds, if not thousands of people that looked frame by frame through both videos there's not one discrepancy on a single frame. So somebody made no mistakes. They did a perfect job on 
over a minute of footage on two different videos, but then they threw in an old, obscure, two-dimensional 90s video game effect, and then they modified it and got it to be, look exactly like what we see somehow. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. Not to mention that you need a 3D rendered environment to have two different angles. Everybody admits that. It would set in 2014, the computer processing is, is not as good as it is today. Would have taken weeks just to process that. And you wouldn't use a 2D visual effect for that. You'd use a 3D visual effect because you needed to have volume. You needed to actually be accurate from the one angle that's from the outer space, as well as the, the side angle on, on that side. You're not going to use a 2D visual effect and have it apply as a 3D angle, especially for our satellite yeah. video. I, I want to show on on our end, your your screen share is coming through a little choppy. Oh. So I just want to show people really quick the, the video from your Twitter. I'm going to pull it up onto their screens. Sure. Um, so they can see it uh, in, in a less. In, oh, I could have probably zoomed in as well. Yeah, fine. But here's, yeah, here's the, the part where it disappears in in full speed. So that's what it looks like uh, at full speed. It, it's it's not quite. I just in case anyone was looking at it, being like, man, that's a little choppy. Like this is this is the twenty four frames per second version. Um, I just I'm wanted to show that to people so they can see it. it. Or can, are they seeing it on the? Screen? Yeah, you got you wouldn't oh, see it on your screen. I was sharing it direct just, okay, just cool. to make sure that none of the Google like you know that there was no lag from Google just showing it direct through Streamlabs yeah, and yeah, back yeah. or on our end. Um, but yeah, I just pulled it over from your Twitter and popped it on screen, so they all saw okay. it. And yeah, it just goes. Zzz, bloop, um <laughs> yeah and a lot of people have the beeps, the sweets tried the to creeps. claim that these would be easy to fake but literally no one will step up to the plate we used to have a two thousand dollar challenge um nobody's able to do it two people did try to reproduce them on reddit and both gave up and said it would be essentially impossible one of them said the hardest parts the volumetric clouds they're super accurate super super yeah. detailed so and there's no issues in anywhere in any frame so most people's uh, reason why they think they're fake is a matter of just not being able to believe. And if you mm. were to take out the orbs and take out the uh, macroscopic quantum uh, coherence that we see there, I think that nobody would have an issue with them being real, which is just funny in my mind, is that the thing that's like the mind block for most people is the science behind it. And we can actually explain the science as well. Now, I'm not great at explaining the orbs and the uh, fractal toroidal moments uh, component of it. But I've got real physicists and real engineers, including Salvatore Pius, who has mm -hmm. what people call UFO patents, who wanted me to set up an interview with him. So I made my own podcast. So you've got to realize the only reason why someone's doing that is because they think they're looking at the technology in that proves their patents to be correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And these are real credentialed people, people that work with the Navy, people that are uh, respected physicists. Um, this is not, you, you've never come to a situation where there's a fake video where you have real physicists and engineers sitting there defending them mm -hmm. and then looking into the science, right. right? This is a unique situation. Yeah. So some, some people did ask to see the, uh, the satellite one again. So I'm going to pull that over oh, where sure. they can see it. You won't see it, but I'll, it, it's again, right from your Twitter. So this is the part where the plane zaps into thin air from the satellite, uh, side of things. Um, now I, I gotta say that is a that would have to be a very different effect if it is an effect uh, just a, an effects pack. That's mm -hmm. not the same one. Um, exactly. From that angle, it obviously you're there. We only get the one, really the one frame of it disappearing in that video. But I, you know, I felt I, I wanted to make sure everybody could see it, uh, you know, as as fluidly as possible. Um, but I think I, I mean now I would say is probably probably the best time to switch over. I know a lot of people have questions. Uh, for those who maybe just tuned in in like the last 10, 15 minutes, uh, Ashton, do you want to kind of give the, basically the, the cliff's notes of what you think happened to this plane? Yeah. And real quick, before I do that, I just want to explain some of the science here. And this is science I've got on notes. I'm kind of cheating here, but it's combined toroidal moments. Can it can cohere electrons or become part of the relationship of the plane acting as electrons around the nucleus of the plane? Which, which extends unshielded electrons uh, at the point of transition. When the electrons are driven from equilibrium, they will self-organize into a matter wave. Solid state objects can be, can uh, can be able to achieve quantum macroscopic co coherence. The orbs, they converge on, the, on their monopoles, making their own azimuth, which is essentially a, a sphere, as they collapse on the plane. The orbs converging are triggering the transitional phase state of the change of the plane. Low temperatures allow the electrons to couple and move as one. These fractal tr toroidal orb moments create unification of the forces that induce the phase singularity, which is what we see as that zap. 
The phases den or properties denote the behavior. So if you obtain the pro quantum properties, that can allow you to get mass reduction. If you get mass reduction, then you get faster time, which means the ability to achieve high speeds and zero gravity. Um, lastly, the plane, plane and the orbs blur in the final frame, indicating potential acceleration, and the plane gets slightly smaller, indicating the potential mass reduction that we're seeing. Real so we quick, can actually see the is, science. Is it possible for you to say that in, in terms a five-year-old would understand? Because when it comes to science, I have like an yeah. eighth-grade education. So here's the simple <laughs> way to think about it. When you see ants and flies, when they zip around super fast, mm -hmm. despite the fact that they're very small, it's because the less mass, the faster time moves. And the faster your time's moving, the faster your speed is. So despite the fact that an ant is very tiny, if you were to scale it up, it would be moving super speed, right? Same mm -hmm. with a fly. But that's not really true. If you were to uh, make it bigger, it's not going to go faster. It's going to actually slow down. And so this is the same concept that's happening in the plane. If the mass, inertial mass becomes zero, mm -hmm. now you are not affected by gravity anymore. And this is what I learned today with Bob Greenier is if your mass becomes zero, it doesn't even take a lot of energy to move the plane at the speed of light. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about something that's microscopic, the amount of energy to move it becomes less and less as well. So this is the same idea is that the, if the plane undergoes this uh, transformation mm -hmm. from fermions to bosons where they can collapse down onto a wave function, now you can speed it up to the speed of light using very little amount of energy. So I, it might just be that I have very little education in physics, but how, how do you reduce a plane's mass without converting to energy? Yeah. So that's the interesting part that I think is the, the science that's essentially been held back from us here. And this is where it comes down to those toroids uh, and that uh, Bob Greenier was talking about earlier today. So you can create this singularity, which some people might call like a wormhole effect. But when you create this the same way that we see those orbs where they are showing zero gravity, that they're able to just float. That's why we have three orbs circling around the plane. This is essentially the minimum number that you would re require to make a singularity at the center point of the plane, why it's tracking and mapping the plane. It is trying to figure out what the azimuth, what the, the sphere around the plane that it needs to be able to create. And it creates this energy field theoretically around the plane, if you want to think of it like that where it's strong enough to separate the plane itself from space-time. Um, right now, that's the best explanation I can give you. I'm okay. trying to get a better ones from talking with engineers. But like you, you know, I was not really an expert on any of this stuff. And yeah. I'm trying to become better on it. Um, we, we need the, the science people to learn how to write like liberal arts majors. Yeah. Because I, 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 every time I read a scientific paper, I'm like, th this person's clearly incredibly intelligent and I would never know it. Yeah, I, I would think this person just read a thesaurus and threw words on a page. I'd be so curious to see more of the physicists talk about this idea yeah. because what, what you're talking about is really interesting. But like the idea of the physics behind what you're describing, like the, you know, the ability to yeah. reduce mass. I mean, the conversion to energy required in that equation would be immense. And for that, for those orbs essentially to then contain that energy to be that small of a signature when it disappears. I mean, you know, it, it's, it mm -hmm. just brings into questions like, where is it going? How is it utilizing that energy? Because I mean, even, you know, when you use, when you accelerate particles in the LHC, uh -huh. you know, getting a, a small, you know, atomic structure to anywhere near the speed of light, it requires an immense amount of energy. I mean, that, I can't remember how many kilometers in circumference that thing is, but like, you know, that's, that's a single atom, you know, to be able to do that with something with the level of mass of an entire commercial airliner that is essentially fully filled. And wouldn't that kill everybody on board? Uh, so that's, I'm not depends. sure about that. Like so, I've, yeah, what I've heard I, today is that it doesn't necessarily have to. If you can create an electromagnetic shield on both sides, it might be able to prevent that. What I would suggest is take a look at the paper that I posted. Is this yesterday? By Salvatore Pius. It has 662,000 views right now. So okay. November 17th. I'll take a look um, at it. There's no way I'm going to understand a goddamn yeah. word in it. <laughs> I mean, I think if you just read, just look at my Twitter post about it, I highlighted and bolded the parts that I think are important. Uh huh. Basically, um, saying so multiple high power, high frequency gravitational waves were, were to be focused mm -hmm. to a particular point in a space time locality, it can induce a space time curvature singularity. Okay. Um, and from a propulsion perspective, it says you can create a gravitational well in its flight path, thereby rolling down this uh, space time curvature dip, analogous to surfing, that you can have a hybrid craft that can move through water and air by being enclosed in a vacuum plasma shield. 
due to the coupled effects of electromagnetic field induced air water particles repulsion. So a lot of this comes down to uh, electrical engineering and having electrical currents basically form gravitational effects, which is where I think the secrets are of the universe is in electrical engineering, interestingly enough. But you're right, this is very advanced concepts. It probably flies over the heads of most layman's for the most part. And I think that's why these scientific papers have been getting ignored. Um, my guess, and not even just a guess, I'm certain that these papers that Salvador Pius has put out, people review them, test them, experiment them uh, with them, that they will you know, be vindicated and show that them to, be, to work. And mm -hmm. I think that we're seeing them on videos. Okay. I, I have... We can do some questions. A literally <laughs> endless number of questions, but I, I think we need yeah. to let the audience because they they paid to ask, so we yes. got we got to take them. Um, yes. Yeah, let's uh, let's take those th those three first, uh, yeah. especially because a couple of them were Kellen. Uh, Kellen yeah. is one of our one of our longest channel viewers. Uh, he is uh, works on works on Navy submarines. Um, so yeah. he uh, he had some some thoughts when we first looked at these, but uh, I wanted yeah. to take. Uh, let's do Donkey Kong and then, and then Kellen for yeah, sure. Sounds good. So Donkey Kong uh, Bata for 1999 says, hello, hello, hello. I've been watching since the collab with the goon. This time is the first time I've been here. Love y'all. Keep me entertained as goon does in the way of Jontron <laughs> with his upload schedule. All the love to y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great guy. Dude is so busy. It's yeah. I, am, I, I envy him. We can confirm it's not his fault yeah. that his upload schedule is what it is. He's just so busy. Yeah. And since people in the chat were asking, Weird Bible is returning in February. Yes. Yes. Yeah, in a slightly new format. Slightly new you format, be but excited. it will be returning. Yes. Um, now to Kellen. Yes, so Kellen has three consecutive uh, messages that are all relevant to the question. Yes. Uh, also, thank you, Kellen. Yeah, That's thanks. a lot of money. Also, thank you for the bucket hats. I think next time we should yeah. bring we them. We should wear them next time. Yeah. Uh, so Kelly official data for 2020 and 10 says possible it was shot down sure likely no as far as the ability to vaporize it or make a wormhole sorry but if we had that tech do you think it would be a secret or that we would be spending the money that we do on uh, static deterrence if we could or might have been strategic deterrence if we could remove the threat before it was launched at us in the end it is probably a mystery that we won't solve just my opinion honestly my most probable theory is that the plane had a critical systems failure, i.e. fire damage, and electronics forced them to navigate without GPS or radios. Yeah, so let me, the fire theory is exactly what I think happened. I think mm -hmm. that 221 kilograms of lithium ion batteries in the in the cargo bay should have been the yeah. you know, most obvious thing for anybody. I don't think we knew how dangerous these lithium ion batteries were back then. Uh, also, and, just not not to cut you off, but to be clear, that was that that battery package was not scanned before yeah, it was loaded onto the plane. Skinned. It was it was checked it was put at, together. It was checked at uh at a different facility, then loaded onto a truck and driven to Kuala Lumpur Airport, and it was not scanned or checked before being put on the plane. So whatever anything that happened between it being checked at the the loading, the packaging facility basically, and it arriving at the plane, there's a there there is a possibility things could have happened. In yeah, that I want to address the other point, though, because uh, actually, Bob Green here, you should check out when I upload the interview I did because it had bad audio today. Check it out because he actually said that we haven't been putting money into like defense for like missiles and things like that because he believes that we have this technology that can essentially just annihilate any type of nuclear weapon that were sent at us. They're just disintegrated mm -hmm. entirely. And that this type of technology could annihilate the plane. Mm -hmm. It could annihilate the planet. It can be used to teleport an object. It can even be used to cloak objects. The reason why we don't think it's cloaking is we see that smoke stop. But he even mentioned that you could not just teleport a plane, but you cover it in, in this field, just like with the balls of plasma that mm -hmm. we see. And then you don't even have to obey the laws of conservation of momentum anymore. You can have it drop with a zero inertia wherever you want, like just set it down somewhere else as well, which is pretty wild. But the part that really stuck out to me was this idea where you shoot a missile at us and we can just deploy this tech and just disintegrate it. And people say, well, why aren't we doing it? Because we don't want to give away our Trump card. If you have a Trump card, you don't just throw it out there every time, right? You hold right. it until you need to use it because the moment you use it, now you're revealing your capabilities, right? And so using this is a very high risk to even use this for this plane. So why bother using it for a plane that was just nothing? Good question. So that's the thing that I don't think it was nothing. There's 20 free scale right. engineers on this plane, but 15 of them were Chinese citizens. Technology. Eight were Chinese and 12 were Malaysian, but they were working okay. for an American company. And this company has ties to U.S. defense and aerospace, mm -hmm. as well as we found a 2005 National Security Agency report 
talking about this uh, emergence of commercial superconductivity. Mm -hmm. Now, this was freescale semiconductors. Yeah, which merged with NXP a year later. Yeah, which got sold to NXP. Uh, a semiconductor or a superconductor is just a, a semiconductor that has perfect conductivity. But once you achieve room temperature superconductivity, now you can start to do what we would think of as magic. And that's okay. what I think is essentially the missing link for all of this mm -hmm. is that once you get to this room temperature superconductivity, you can now uh, create these gravitational and weight uh, effects that are so strong that you can break space time as we see it, you know, where mm -hmm. you can separate the object, create this field around it. The part I don't understand is, is does the superconductivity lead to that or do these toroids lead to the superconductivity? I'm still a little unsure about that, but I've got a long way to go on the science front. Yeah. All right. Understandable. So. Uh, next is Miss Mori for $5 saying, one of the excuses I heard for the south-north-south shifting was that he flew over his home before he unalived the plane. Seemed sus, still does. I don't believe for a second that Captain Shaw intended to down that plane. I think that was the Malaysian government trying to cover for their own failures, regardless of what happened. They were trying to prevent it from being the airline's fault, and they wanted to make it the pilot's fault. He was a, a like suicidal, murderous, political extremist. And I... The guy literally had like a YouTube channel where he showed people how to fix up their houses, looked like he absolutely loved his job, and the only thing I could find about political extremism was that he uh, he supported the opposition party and attended a rally for the leader. That is literally no different than an average Republican in this country going to a Trump rally. Like there, there's- They this guy, man. They I, I, I was- stood up for him. I was disgusted. Yeah, they, these, they tried to make up some lies about him being in a bad situation with his wife. They made up lies about him being depressed. They mm -hmm. made up lies there about There was something him, about like, like his brother allegedly being imprisoned for political extremism. <laughs> so he stole the plane to try and convince them to let his brother out. And I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. It's yeah. scary how much they vilified this guy. It's embarrassing. Yeah. And I feel so bad because also this idea that he flew over his hometown. Mm -hmm. So apparently his hometown was like in Penang somewhere. They flew over it at two in the morning. It's yeah. pitch black. It's not like he's... This idea that a suicidal pilot's going to say goodbye, hey, bye, hometown. <laughs> now let's go for a yeah. six-hour joyride. When people commit suicide in planes, they crash them immediately. Mm -hmm. Like the the even 9-11, all those planes were not in the air for hours. Like they they take off, they get hijacked, they turn them. UA-93, where the American heroes fought back, like that plane crashes immediately. Mm -hmm. German Wings, 2015. He locks the co-pilot out. They change the policies after that. Mm -hmm. Locks him out. He crashes the plane in under 10 minutes. It's mm -hmm. not a situation where you're going on a joyride to say goodbye to your hometown. Like yeah. The cover story is just ridiculous. I absolutely don't believe the story that it flew south for six hours. I think that's complete nonsense. It makes no sense whatsoever. But yeah, I want to go to yep. Concerning Cakes. Cakes said some dollars because I'm thankful for you boys and it's Thanksgiving. Yep. So Thank you, Cakes. Uh, and then we also had one yeah. from uh, Concerning Cafe for 499 says, The search for the plane reminds me of how the U.S. Navy knew that the Ocean Gate sub imploded and they allowed the search to happen for a week. Yeah, that's yeah. why, I, that's why I, I am not immediately skeptical of the idea that, so, that some government was hiding the fact that they knew what happened the entire time. I think regardless of whether you're right or it was something a lot more mundane, the government knew what happened immediately and they just completely ignored it to allow it to go on yeah so i don't think that it was set up by the u.s government to distract from something because i can't really think of anything that we were doing that was something we wouldn't want the public to know about around march 2014 i can't really yeah. think i mean I, that might be when isis started doing stuff but so let me quickly address that because that's really strong so why didn't this plane crash in the south Indian ocean no debris field most expensive search didn't find anything the official mm -hmm. search found nothing no black boxes found in the South Indian Ocean. The SOSA system you just mentioned would have heard it in the South Indian Ocean. Same one that they lied about the Titan sub. Two other acoustic detectors, Western Australia and Diego Garcia, also heard nothing. Two radar systems, Indonesia and Australia, saw nothing. Mm -hmm. 19 families of the family's victims' phones were ringing. One was proven on TV. There's an active shipping route, no witnesses. None of them see any debris. The mm -hmm. official flight path has it running out of gas. There's nowhere else for it to go. People are like, the ocean's really big. Well, where do you guys think it went? It didn't yeah. go to Antarctica. There's nowhere else for the plane to go. And then That's actually day, what some people have said, is that it went to Antarctica. I'm not even kidding. It can't reach there. There's no, it couldn't. There's not enough gas to get there. And then the last part is there's four And he knew that, DLT. to be clear. Captain Sean, it might be Captain Zahari. I, I can't totally tell. I don't know how Indonesian names, or Malaysian names work necessarily. I don't think they work quite the same as ours. But he would have known he was not making it to Antarctica. 
<laughs> also, like, yeah. why would he bring a fully packed commercial airliner to Antarctica? Yeah, no. But, but also, really quick, yeah. uh, somebody threw yeah, in a, a non-Super Chat comment that I just wanted to address, mainly for uh, getting the respects. But uh, where was it? It was essentially um, uh, an outlier of the whole pilot thing of saying uh, Sky King, you know, took it, took it for a joyride and then putting it down. No, yeah, down somebody actually did say that. Uh, chat. Andrew Fiat. Oh, there Andrew we go. Yeah, so said Sky King Joy Rider for a while before noon. Yeah. So, yeah. But I don't think it didn't seem to me like. I mainly just wanted to pay for yeah. the respects of yeah, like, you know, he had a couple screws loose, but he didn't have then, you know, it's... RIP, man. Sometimes reasonable men must be driven to unreasonable things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was a sad story of somebody taking the opportunity of the last moments of their life to live to the fullest of the extent. And it's yeah. sad, and we wish that wasn't the case, but we do want to pay res respects to the guy. Yeah. Um, he didn't hurt anybody, so. No. Which is really impressive. Yeah, almost as impressive as the barrel roll that he pulled off. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you were going to say, sorry. I forget what I was going to say. That's, oh, no, you were uh, talking specifically about the captain and the Antarctica bit that he wanted to Oh, yeah, I was just saying he would have known that he could not get to Antarctica with the amount of fuel that was in that plane. Yeah. Like, that. It, it's I, I get where people are coming from, guys. Operation High Jump was not some sort of weird secret Antarctica thing, and Admiral Byrd never flew over the North Pole. His, his, the, the journal saying he did was edited, I believe, by his son and released years later. It does not match his actual flight journal. So, Admiral Byrd turned around before reaching the North Pole. He did not fly over the entrance to Agartha. It's BS that is spread by BS artists. Um, that is, that is not a thing that happened. And it's verifiably not a thing that happened. Um, and yes, I know I mentioned Agartha and Wendigoon is not showing his face. Uh, <laughs> every, every time Agartha comes up, somebody's like, where is he? Uh, but yeah, True. so next. Uh, wait, so, yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask him to finish his point. There's some questions. Keep going. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so Ryan wake up for $5.77. Love the specificity. I remember doing a project on Malaysia the year it happened, and my partner snuck in a flight 370 joke. Good having Thorne Bosey back and miss you as well. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. They did miss you. Um, based poll up for $50. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, have either of you heard of the theory about some of the engineers filing important patents re relating to quantum computing for the flight? That would be something you would yeah, know about. I have heard that actually as well. Were you um, able to verify? No, I wasn't able to verify, but a podcaster told me that as well. I mean, yeah. again, what it matters there is what's the motive, right? It's the people and the technology and the intellectual property, right? It's to risk something this huge. It can't be about just money, in my opinion. It's got to be about the technology and the intellectual property. Because whoever controls this technology is going to control the world. Uh, you can potentially even destroy the world with this technology. So that's that's the that's at stake here. Believe it or not, that's really what we're dealing with. That's probably why you cover it up. That's why it has to be kept hidden. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Lost for Ride for four ninety nine says hi, Aiden. I had to miss most of the stream sadly, but I wanted to ask if you've yes. seen some ordinary gamer's opinion on the assistant. I love you. Guys. Yeah, we we brought that one up. Yeah, I, uh, you know, he he seems to fall on the side of he thinks it's he thinks that it is just VFX. I. Uh, I, I I I know I do not know enough about any of these topics to form a serious opinion on the video itself. All I can look at is the fact that I didn't know. Not you, Siri. Siri turned on on Aiden's computer. Uh, anyway, yeah. I based on what I saw, I I don't believe the plane ever flew south on autopilot for six hours. I think that the FBI made that up. Uh, why do I think the FBI made that up? Because look at how many times the FBI has lied to the American people. That's why. Siri, turn off. When you stop talking, it will. <laughs> it's the feds. They're listening to us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, and then last one that we have uh, is Agamemnon's gym bag for $2.69. Love it. Uh, X to Dell. <laughs> Love the uh, the reference there. Good, good reference. Yeah, I mean, I, I look at it. I, I definitely don't believe that, that the official narrative is correct. I... Uh, I am curious, Ashton, to your thoughts of, on, on one main thing, which is the plane's speed, and for, for two reasons. One is that the distance that would have allegedly been traveled if the plane turned around after either Agari or Baitad, which I have learned that you say the word instead of just saying out the numbers, or the letters apparently, but uh, yeah. So if it turned around at either Agari or Baitad, then in order for it to reach Point Mikar when it supposedly did, it would have had to have flown 650 miles in 61 minutes with a cruising speed of 590 miles per hour. I uh, that's that's an additional 60 miles per hour which so far as I can tell the plane could not have done that and made those turns in that time frame. 
at, but that is at cruising altitude. And it seems like what you're suggesting is it was flying lower, which means it could have flown faster. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to say an expert there, but what I will say is that nobody has questioned the, the whether or not it can get there because it was actually a, there on the official flight path as well when it turned mm -hmm. into the South Indian Ocean at that time. So uh, I think that you have a lot of factors that determine the speed, includes what the winds were at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, the plane can go at least, I think, 600 miles an hour. So It can make it up to 600. I think it can yeah. go at least 620. Yeah, that makes sense. I, and I've yeah. flown a lot. And if you have the wind tailwinds as well, I've had planes go even significantly mm -hmm. faster. So yeah. I don't think there's any issue with the plane getting there. The bigger question is, is the turn accurate? And the turn we see in the videos is accurate to a 777-200, okay. which according to the Top Gun Maverick, VFX artists, and this was somebody who posted on social media, so you don't have to believe it, but it's, again, something that would be verifiable. We could find that person theoretically. Claims that that is something they even had to fake in the Top Gun Maverick t uh, movie because that's one of the hardest things to do is to get it to be accurate to real-world speeds mm -hmm. for planes like that. Okay. somebody, Some people are saying that it can't fly that fast lower than cruise altitude because it, it would rip apart. But, I, I, again, I, I, as always, we encourage people to comment if they know things because when we – we, we always talk about things multiple times because we'll be talking about something else and it'll relate back and we can then go back and talk about things. But yeah, so if there's any pilots who have flown 777s in the chat, like, please let us know your thoughts on, on that aspect. The other one, Ashton, would be, uh, you said that in the, the satellite video, it appears to be flying at about Mach 3. That's about 2,000 miles an hour. So we can see that the orbs are moving between 10 and 13 times faster than the plane just from a frame rate comparison. But how, how could the plane moving... reach that speed without breaking up? No, the plane's no, no, the orbs. not. The the plane oh, so the orbs you're saying are flying. Miles 200, yes. Okay, so the, the plane, plane you're yeah. saying is flying at its normal its normal pace. definitely not moving. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's where I was kind of like mixed up. So I was like, is he saying the plane was going Mach 3? Because... <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you're saying the plane was probably going at about its its maximum speed. And yeah. then the orbs were Correct. probably going at around 2,000 miles an hour. Yeah, okay, exactly. I understand how. Yeah. I, now I understand. That's been bugging me since the very beginning of the podcast, but I didn't know what the best time to bring it up was, and now I feel dumb. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the one thing that in, intrigues me is I'm, I'm curious of the... I'm curious to hear more of the scientific theorizing about the orbs in particular, because to have, to have objects, if they have physical volume based on their mass... At that speed, I'd be curious to see whether or not, by comparison, if you can see uh, the shock waves of reaching supersonic speeds from things like that in a thermal imaging camera. And likewise, uh, you know, what the theorizing of those objects specifically, whether it be because I know you mentioned plasma at one point and the... Uh, you know, the, the donut within a donut kind of thing of like the lithium. Mm -hmm. I know somebody mentioned, I'd be really curious to see how those elements come together uh, to essentially create the visuals that we were witnessing. Yeah, I think that uh, you're not going to see any type of uh, supersonic speed friction because these objects have reduced their mass by taking themselves entirely out of space time, out of space time vacuum. And that's why they're able to achieve those speeds to begin with. Otherwise, there would be too much friction for that to even happen, mm -hmm. right? And this is also how they can be trans-medium, how they can go through water as well, which is, you know, a lot more dense than air. So that's, I think, the, the secret here for, you know, how these things can fly. And this is also consistent with UFOlogy, which is part of the reason why I think that this technology is reverse engineered. I think that if we didn't have UFOlogy, I don't think there would be any chance that we could have this type of technology or figure this out by now. And then, Ashton, one quick thing is, um, I, I, you may have mentioned this somewhere previously, but I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm remembering correctly. How was it that you came to, to find these videos? Yeah, so, I mean, I just saw them on, on Reddit, like everybody else, on social okay. media. I had seen one in 2014. I would testify to that. I think thousands of people saw, it, saw them as well. We've proven they go back to that far on the, on the archives. And uh, I was just one of the people that didn't let it go. You know, I think that anybody could be me. I'm not anybody special. All it takes is to think for yourself, to not go with what other people tell you is true. I think that especially in the social media age, social contagion takes over. And a lot of people just think as well, especially if you look in the chat here, that whatever they've been told by the authorities is the only thing that can be real. You know, And I think that if we want to advance as a civilization, we need to start learning how to critically think for ourselves, not assume that everything we see is fake, uh, which is going to be harder and harder as time goes on, and instead look into it. The science is going to check out. The science will vindicate these videos and will vindicate the people around them. 
the people that can't believe in them are going to end up looking like fools. So I would say don't be the type of person who is like a negative gatekeeper, as I would refer to it, as the type of people that think that everything you know is the only thing that can be real. And keep your mind open, you mm -hmm. know? Follow the scientific method. The scientific method isn't, this can't be real, this is fake. The scientific method is come up with a hypothesis, which is a story, mm -hmm. look at the evidence, compare the evidence, and if you if it doesn't fit your hypothesis, and then you come up with a new hypothesis, <clears throat> right? And that's how we have been following this investigation. I think that's a great message for yeah. anyone to lead, you know, their, their research on. Yeah, I mean, at the very least, what I'm what I'm getting out of this is that the the MH370X project really is about finding the truth. It's it's just what we have to compile a whole bunch of data from numerous fields of quantum physics to make that happen. Um, and also, you know, you got to look at the, what were the governments doing. You know, what's what, and, and that's what we're going to be doing in our part two of the video is you know looking at all of these theories. Your your theory, Ashton, as well as yeah. Jeff Wise's theory. I'm sorry, it's just so stupid. <laughs> the Russians took it. Uh, why? Uh, anyway, yeah. So we're gonna be looking into all that. Um, and I, I might, I might email you with some questions as well sure. over the course of the the next week. Um, you know, no, no worries if you can't get to them. But uh, just as I, I follow up, I know we we've gone a little over, so I don't want to hold you too long. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm very intrigued. I think that the the key here is that the government lied. That whatever they say happened did not happen. I'm just, my, my biggest hang up, and maybe this is something you'll be able to find an answer to in the future, is what would the motivation be for specifically taking that plane, especially if it was going to go down anyway. So I, I could get it if it was on its way to China and they intercepted it and it was free scale semiconductor. They wanted to stop that from making it to China. But I don't understand why if it was going to go down on its own, they would bother, I guess, is where I'm, where I'm most I mean, there's only one answer, both. right? Yeah, to save the plane, right? To save yeah. the scientists on board because they have intellectual property you can't afford to lose is the only thing I can come gotcha. up with. The other one that people mention, you know, I think that, you know, preventing them to go to China, but it doesn't make sense if it's doomed, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe if, maybe it's not doomed and maybe they are doing that. Maybe there is an element of espionage at play here. And then the other one that somebody brought up is, well, if it's doomed, maybe this is like you, you break out, okay, we can test this weapon because, or test this technology because even if it goes horribly, right? Then, uh, you know, not we really haven't lost anything. But to me, the problem with that is now you have to develop this whole cover story about going to the South Indian Ocean, which if it falls apart, it seems like a lot of risk. So to me, the only narrative that makes sense from that perspective is saving them. But I'm going to go back to what Kim.com said in our space, uh, which is that we should only really, I think, stick to what we know and what we can prove. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we've got to let the government tell us what the rest is, right? Where did it go? What happened to the passengers? You know, I can't, I, we don't have two more videos on the other side telling us where it went. Uh, and we can't test, we can't speak to the mm -hmm. motivations of the government. I know I don't trust them to tell the truth, but we've stacked evidence so high now. Like we just said, there's only a few motives that even make sense, right? So we need them to speak mm -hmm. up. The fact that they haven't spoken up, the fact that the media hasn't spoken up, that should guys tell you guys that this is real. The media has no problem making fun of people that they think they can discredit mm -hmm. and prove things are fake. They do it all the time, every single day. None of the media will reach out to me because they know it's not going to go that way. They know that the more people that look at this evidence, the more it's going to unravel the conspiracy. And so they're not even willing to even talk to me. They're not even willing to try to ridicule me. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in mind, guys. Yeah. I, there, there was one more that came through, which if you if you sure. don't mind. Yeah, uh, yeah we can yeah. keep going. I'm not in a rush yeah, here. This was the last one, I think. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it was Agamemnon's gym bag for 556. Five, Again, love the specificity. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, Ash and I joined late, but the first thing I heard was the nucleus of the plane. Apologies if you've explained this already, but what do you mean? Yeah. So what I mean is that in order to obtain the properties of quantum, you have to emulate the properties of quantum. So the idea here is that you essentially turn the plane into a nucleus and you have the electrons form a coherent matter wave around it. This essentially tricks the universe for it to act the same way that you could have a quantum uh, atom act, which is now you have something that's massless, something that can move at the speed of light. And that's essentially how it's been described to me is what's happening here. A lot of people compare this to the movie Contact, where they build this device and Jodie Foster goes in it and you have these ring formations flipping around it. Mm -hmm. Even when you watch the orbs spin around the plane, it looks like electrons flowing around the, uh, a nucleus. So this is, uh, you know, now again, this is how it's been kind of described to me. What we need here is we need a unification theory of quantum and macro. It has to exist. We have to know why quantum objects act differently than macro objects. And this is how it's been explained is the answer is that they aren't any different. 
Mm -hmm. All we have to do is we have to get the electrons to cohere on a macroscopic level. And you can get even something like an airplane to act as the same properties of a quantum object, which seems incredible. Seems incredible to me as well, guys, but we're looking at it in two videos. So yeah. let's try to understand it. I, regardless, I, I feel like we're, we're going to find out. We're, we're approaching the point where the government has to say we lied to you about MH370 regardless, because... I think that at the very least, what what has been proven now by through and, and I think has been reinforced through your work is the fact that there the official narrative does not line up. Whether it was sucked into a portal or not, it what they said happened was a lie, uh, and I think that's the important part, and that's the thing people need to be harping on. Um, I, I mean, I would encourage everybody to 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 follow what you're working on and and you know keep an eye on it and. I would say the same for anybody else who's looking into it. You know, I think I think the way we get to the bottom of these things, the way we force answers, is not necessarily to come forward and say, this is my theory and I know I'm right, but rather to say, this is my theory, what does everybody else think? And then we can pick each other's theories apart, pull out the, the bad stuff, the stuff that doesn't make sense, and what we're going to be left with is a series of facts that will be undeniable. At a certain point, um, yeah. but you know, I, I'm I'm excited about the direction things are moving. I uh, I have a lot of respect for what you <laughs> excuse me. I have a lot of respect for what you've been. <laughs> my God, I swallowed wrong. I have a lot of respect for what you've been doing. I I swear to God, those coughs were a coincidence. Uh, <laughs> I was not in any way intended to be passive aggressive. I just swallowed wrong. <laughs> I realize how bad that sounds, but. As I was saying, I have a lot of respect for what you're doing. I have a lot of respect for what everybody in the community is doing for this, and I really do just hope that. At a certain point, everyone drops the the rivalries and the you know the the tribalism and just focuses on the facts because, at the very least, I think we need to clear Captain Shaw's name yeah once and for all I because mean, nobody nobody should be put through the ringer like that after they died, and especially the the damage to his family that has been caused. I think that's unforgivable, and if it is proven that he was scapegoated, then at the very least, amends can be made. Yeah, some justice uh, for him. Some justice for his family. That's And at this point, that's the part that I care the most about, um, is is that at some point, the families of, of these victims are are allowed to know what actually happened to their loved ones. Yeah. Um, it's it's the very same thing that we've always pursued with our Missing 401 Smiley Face Killer stuff, and now Smiley Face Killer stuff, yeah. is... Where somebody lied, we want to get the truth for the closure to the family. Yep. That is that is our primary goal. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm excited to follow things. And Ashton, if you if you come across anything else that you you want uh, to to talk about, please let me know. Um, yep. You know, we're always happy to sit here and be a, a sounding board at the very least for anyone who is actually seeking the truth. Yeah, the important thing that everybody should remember is that if we all have the same goal, the best way to get to it the fastest possible is for everybody to work together. You know, instead of, like Matt has said, everybody saying, you know, I'm right and I'm not going to hear otherwise, the more we ask questions of each other and come to a mutual understanding and, and you know, challenge each other to, to learn more and figure out the questions and find answers as quickly as we can, you know, the better everything can actually yeah. be solved. Sorry. You're I was, fine. I was trying to find the right end of that sentence, yeah. but I did You're not good. find it. You're, you're like, having oh. a bit of a Steve Carell in the office moment. I get it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, but Ashley, so... Uh, yeah. Obviously, we, we're 15 minutes over. We're gonna we're gonna close things down. But is there That's anywhere cool. that people should follow you? Anything that they should be on the lookout for? Anyone else you suggest uh, that that we talk to or that everybody else take a look at? Yeah. Um, so I would say just you know I agree with what you guys said on the evidence side, right? Like it, we should be reviewing the evidence and trying to determine what the best story is that makes sense with all the evidence. And, you know, I think that's part of the problem. What's happened is that no one's refuted the evidence that I put forth. I put forth 12 pages of evidence for this and no one will essentially refute like even a single point of it. Um, and there needs to be a, a pretty complete refutation in order to come up with a different story. So I, I welcome to be able to do that. I hope people stop personally attacking me because that just belittles yourself and discredits yourself when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, I've never been community noted, not a single time. I have 10 million views this week alone. I've never once been community noted. You can find me on Twitter at JustXAshton, or you can find me on YouTube at JustXAshton as well. So take a look at that. All right. Yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on and for uh, for sharing everything with us. We really appreciate it. And I, I think you make some uh, several very good points. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't know that I'm convinced on the wormhole yet, <laughs> but I am I am 
I am kind of in the position to be persuaded in either direction right now. Oh, oh yeah, at, at the very least, I'm excited by the possible, yeah. you know, essentially just leaps and bound advancements in, well, you know, terrified in, yeah, in, in quantum <laughs> and, you know, macro, or sorry, yeah, yeah, quantum and macro physical, like, you know, understanding. I mean, the the, the things being described here and the, the potential, you know, just absolutely mind-blowing discoveries that either have happened or, you know, and are being covered up or that could happen, you know, at least for the general public, are fascinating. I have said it before and I will say it again. Every single scientific team doing anything at all needs a philosophy student on staff to be like, hey, guys, no. Or at the very no, it's a bad idea. Because it, it solves two problems. Yes. One, the fact that many, many scientists really do not consider the consequences of what they're looking into. And the yes. other one is, what philosophy major has a job? True. Or we could just <laughs> hire Jeff Goldblum to go to every different place and say, you were so busy whether or not you could, you didn't stop to think about whether or not yeah. you should. Just and with, an that, annual thing. with that said... Ashton, thank you so much for hanging out. We're going to close the stream down now. Thank you guys for viewing and for making these two videos. This podcast is one of our most viewed ever as well. So thank you guys for hanging out. And we'll have part two out the first week of December. The video coming out this upcoming Friday. We'll be back to our horror movie lore. And we're going to be talking about Freddy Krueger. So obviously this channel is all over the place. <laughs> A little bit. But thank you guys so much. And we will thank see you, you much, on guys. the next one. Absolutely. All right. See you guys.